in the textile industry, when you're combining electronics and electrodes and sensors, it may be a poor wearing comfort scenario. So, you know, how do you bulk all of these things together into something positive? Um, well, in textile manufacturing, if you can incorporate the yarn all in one step, uh, you can reduce um, the various steps it makes to, to make a garment. Um, and in the textile industry, a lot of that is hands-on through cutting and sewing. Recognizably, in the electronics community, uh, there's a lot of automation. So there's an opportunity to have a reduction of technologies, maybe, and steps leading you into any textile. Uh, certainly textile is a volume production process, which can compete with the electronic volume. Um, and once you get into volume, then you can generate lower costs. Um, you can buy the speed of the machines. Um, you can integrate functionality differently to try to increase that comfortability um, and the haptics and the flexibility through the use of the textile. And then ultimately, you're trying to get to uh, a customer acceptance, not only in appearance, but in functionality. Um, so it's a complex uh, road that you're entering, um, but it's been done. Uh, we see a lot of methods of e-integration um, through some of the, what I call the low-hanging fruit or the, the early adopter, or best way to get there, really, with the materials um, and processes that are available today. On the left side of your screen, you'll see that uh, that would be the, what I call textile manipulation. Uh, this is taking a, a textile product and then manipulating it to adapt to an electronic component through the use of uh, embroidery or lamination, where you take a film, a conductive film or a foam and adhere it with heat and pressure. Um, there's other layering techniques just by cutting and, and sewing, stacking, and tacking um, the components down. There's ways in plating, coating, and uh, etching where you can uh, cover a textile in an electronic uh, material um, and then you can take it off or you can uh, place the electronic material in a certain locations of the textile. Uh, so an example of that would be an, a silver coated fabric, for example. That fabric largely would be nylon um, and the silver coating would stick to the nylon in the electrochemical plating process. Uh, but if you made that fabric nylon and polyester, then the, the silver would only stick to the nylon and therefore anywhere that you have polyester, you could create a pattern um, of non-conductive areas. Um, and then of course, by way, creating patterns of conductive areas. Um, and then certainly in indirect printing. So this is where a uh, print material, silver material, uh, is put onto a stretchable substrate or a film, and then that film then is laminated. So in, in a or it's heat transferred on. So these these are the areas of textile manipulation that are in the system now. Um, we find a lot of hats and jackets and uh, gloves uh, are made through this technique and a lot of the big commercialized things are used through these techniques. Um, the techniques that we're gonna talk about m going forward today um, are about formation. Um, and this is how you actually interlace fibers and yarns into textile structures. Um, and so here's some examples of those flexible circuits that I, I talked about and those stretchable printed um, circuits that are available and then some of the components going into those manipulated textiles. Uh, Bebop has won a number of awards with their integrated sensor glove. Um, there's a lot of this uh, silver trace printing allowing uh, heat uh, and illumination. Um, Lumia has a sample developer kit and recently has launched their own apparel jacket that incorporates uh, their uh, complete component system. So this is a textile component system made using this manipulation technique, but then this system can easily be a plug and play to your garment or end item um, in, in the areas of heat and, and lighting and, and um, sensing, I think, as well. Uh, other jackets that are uh, coming together to uh, heat your hand through the inside glove um, and then 
uh, athletic materials, um, and then even more industrial materials where you're trying to print and heat. Um, and so getting back to electronically integrated textiles, um, where the fiber or the yarn component has the conductive element to it and is permanently integrated um, into uh, the textile itself, um, creating a circuit or parts of electrical circuit. Um, and then these stages, of course, as I mentioned, are in the fiber, um, in the yarn, and then subsequently into the fabric. Um, I like to talk about yarn being the next invention. Um, certainly, uh, yarn processes necessarily aren't new inventions, but the combinations and um, the minerals and materials that are actually being extruded into and within the yarn component. Um, and then just taking wire, bare wire, and covering it with other fibrous materials and other yarns, making it an individualized yarn component, um, really are becoming the next inventions. Um, as these are created, they're, they're put into some kind of application that gives us all hope um, that electronic textiles will in fact become the multi-hundred million to billion dollar industry um, in the next uh, five to 10 years. Um, when you're using yarn into textiles, one thing you should really consider is the full uh, textile equation. Um, and that's going from yarn to really finished product. Um, there's a lot of stages and steps along the way and each textile formation system has their own nuances. Um, and then, you can modify that textile product with a finishing package that allows coloration or protective uh, treatments from environmental conditions or bacterias. And then, of course, you can laminate it. Um, this would be a completed e-textile, then could be laminated with a foam or uh, a silicone overcoat, um, or it can be printed. Um, indirectly or directly at that point to give you aesthetics or conductivity, really. And then finally, you transform that rolled good or die cut piece into um, a finished garment or gear item or industrial product. And so this full textile equation, if you forget about everything that needs to be done from end to end, um, you could get halfway through the process and realize that the yarn selection you've made doesn't allow for this particular um, printing technique or doesn't allow for this coloration technique um, to meet the requirements and now you have to go back through the loop. Um, so not really knowing the full plan can sometimes hurt you in time. And, and so across the top, um, I've got sort of a, a brief timing plan but um, in the yarn phase, you can definitely spend up to a year um, if you're just sort of out looking for a blue sky and creating your own scenario where you're combining existing type products together to make something extremely unique for yourself and your end product. Um, but if you're looking at e-yarns that are available today, which there are a lot more than there were last year and a lot more than there were the year before that, um, you can reduce that um, significantly, that time. Um, but nevertheless, going forward after yarn, you're still about another year um, to the finished end product by the time you go through your uh, various structure trials through the designated textile formation method and the complete finishing, and then your transformation processes and your final product. It could be a two-year um, endeavor. Um, and so here are examples of a few yarns um, that could take that two year time for you to integrate. Um, but these are cutting edge type yarns that will enable uh, superpowers to the textile in which they end up in. Um, this one is from the Advanced Functional Fabrics of America in Boston. They have a Li-Fi yarn that is thermally drawn with sensors and LEDs and diodes and so forth embedded into the core. Um, this is a, um, a manufacturing readiness level of six, 
um, I think, and there, there's definitely some work to do in the bendability of this particular fiber, uh, but it shows a lot of promise in the communications world. Um, another super yarn um, is one that was developed at Drexel for flexible energy storage um, using a combination of natural fibers, carbon and cotton, and uh, other fibers including uh, steel yarns in a twisted uh, finishing system that allows for energy to actually be stored. So you can see this is very much in the research phase um, at a manufacturing readiness level of three. Uh, but the concept enables, you know, yarn companies and future innovators uh, to think about how the process might be streamlined or it might be accelerated uh, to get something to market. And then lastly, um, in the super yarn category is a actually commercially available yarn uh, through Volt uh, Supreme Corporation. It is a copper wire that is covered. Um, and it can be covered in nylon or polyester, Kevlar. Um, and, and the covering allows for the insulation of the copper wire and they have various uh, concentrations of wire or, or amounts of wire to achieve different resistance levels and durability requirements. Um, so the, the yarn process, um, whether you call it a yarn or whether you call it a fiber optic, a capacitor or a storage device, um, really are enabling the next generation of, of textiles. Uh, and so some ways that you go about getting these yarns into structures um, are weaving. Um, I think all of us have uh, a bunch of genes and we kind of know how that weaving thing works. Um, you have a vertical and horizontal strands that are interlaced together. Um, and so the world of consumer electronics and apparel have merged with this Levi jacket um, that Google partnered with. And um, uh, it's a very interesting way of creating a, a circuit. And there's um, application ideas from apparel to military. Um, and this is a fairly simple way of, of doing conductive technologies. Another way of doing uh, conductive technologies is through weft knitting. And uh, weft knitting is um, done either in a circular form, like the image of the machine on the right, um, or in a flat state, like the center machine. I, I apologize for that extra, uh, extra wording in there. That's an error. But on the left, you can see a hand knitting machine. And so this is what students learn on and a lot of home knitters work on to make hats and scarves. Um, and, and in the industry world, uh, t-shirts, um, fully formed sweaters can be made, um, and industrial products can be made from this type of knitting. It's, it's got an uh, increased speed um, over the past few years, and there's a lot of output in the athleisure world as well. And so it is a very interesting technology because of the body-worn um, garments and so forth. Um, but today I'm really gonna talk more about warp knitting. Warp knitting, as I mentioned, is the business of Apex Mills. Um, it's also really the big business of the textile industry. Um, it is uh, very high precision and extremely fast textile formation. Um, we also work in the body worn uh, garments for athleisure and professional sports and, and um, actually all sports, sporting industries. If you think about the jerseys and the pants of the players, those are all warp knits. Um, but also in the home furnishings and decorative world, there's uh, lace for curtains and, and doilies for furniture. That's all warp knitted. Um, and then you have on the far left is this 3D spacer category, which is uh, large in footwear and contract furniture. Um, and then, of course, you have um, footwear itself, which uh, is, is made to precision on warp knitting equipment. So the fly knit um, is an example of weft knitting. Um, but everything that looks like a fly knit that isn't is made on warp knitting. And so th the reason being is because of the speed. Um, here's some other examples of seamless warp knitting and warp knitting where you're allowed to engineer the structure. So structures can be placed strategically along the panel of the fabric. And those structures can do different things. So they can allow for pattern and comfort or breathability um, or conductivity. 
And, uh, and so what kind of materials can be used with warp knitting? Uh, well, most kinds really. Um, silver coated yarns work just fine. Carbon yarns, insulated metal filaments uh, and metallized yarns. Uh, really it's the flexibility that determines whether the yarn can be knittable. Um, and a bending radius um, is easy to do. If you can bend the yarn over your finger or tie it in a knot, um, it's a pretty good hands-on indicator that that flexibility is good enough for you to knit. The diameter of the yarn or the, or the heavy um, weight of the yarn called the denier or tex, um, now that can play into the different types of Sorry, I was just interrupted by Zoom. Andrea, I don't want to interrupt myself, but I want to make sure that I'm not repeating myself. Yeah, so it looks like um, you stopped sharing. Oh, okay. That's bizarre. Am I sharing again? Yes, yep. And it looks like you just have to go into present presentation. Yep, there you go. Oh, all right. I'm, Perfect. I apologize, everyone. Um, and so again, I think I was saying about the speed um, of of the, the knitting. That may have to uh, be adjusted. And of course, the speed of the knitting uh, translates into the cost of the fabric. It's basically an, an output per hour or an output per day type calculation. And, and so if the machine's slower, then there's, there's less output and the costs can be higher. And then of course, the cost of the raw materials making things conductive uh, can typically be much higher. Um, the timing for warp knitting development, um, really we at Apex Mills like to say it all starts with you uh, because we're an a, a applications company that does specialty fabrics. And so it's you that has the application idea and it's the manufacturer, us, that allows you to enable that idea. Um, and so if you remember from the textile equation, you know, the yarn component could take you quite some time. Um, however, at Apex Mills, we have a very large inventory of yarns and we can certainly access commercially available yarns quickly to speed up the prototyping process. Um, we like to work no more than a six month time frame for about two iterations of samples that allow you to receive fabric, try it into your application, see if it meets your requirements, identify uh, the pros and cons of that sample. We will re-knit to, to do a better trial and then you would receive that fabric to follow up with the retesting. Um, so textiles are an iterative approach, much like consumer electronics. It's just not overnight um, and, and you really can't throw people at it to help make it go faster. Um, there's a lot of processes involved and they have to be done with precision and care um, in every step because um, every step builds on itself. One thing that we like to do is utilize visualization tools. Uh, CAD development tools in, this, in the textile industry are um, very prominent now and very effective. Uh, even further than that, there are some modeling tools and of course, there are visualization through avatar tools that exist in the apparel industry where you can map a fabric onto a model and, and see how it drapes and so forth. And so working with all of these integrated type CAD systems can really help accelerate um, the textile design ideas and so much to where you can see how a fabric might bend and stretch and open uh, during deformation. Uh, and so here is an example of a warp knitting machine working on an e-textile.
So really the key takeaway from this uh, video is to really show you that this machine is moving at about uh, one third speed of its normal capacity. Um, these particular yarns are, are brittle and sensitive and they're pulling off of a creel and you don't want to break them as they're going into the machine through the, the tensions. And so it's really, um, it's important, especially when you're prototyping to start out slow uh, so that you can give yourself the best chance to not damage the conductive material if it happens to be very sensitive. Although there are a lot of conductive materials that will run at near full speed as well, but they might not deliver a full communications. You know, you have to level set your expectations based on available equipment, available yarns, um, and then what you want the functionality to do. Maybe you can't have all functionalities uh, at the first time and you work your way into adding the functionalities over time. Uh, and, um, and so that machine was running in North Carolina. Apex Mills is a North American uh, manufacturer and exporter. And we're very much a part of the Manufacturing USA initiatives. There are many brands that have discussed onshoring. Um, of course, our military is very active in the participation of the U.S. textile industry. And um, they have come together and developed in a couple of years ago a few uh, defense manufacturing institutes. And one of them was the Advanced Functional Fabrics of America. Apex Mills joined that membership in hopes of helping to elevate uh, the uh, TR4 through 7 technologies to some kind of mass scale. And so we're working in the areas of photovoltaics, energy harvesting, optical communication, and color changing in, into embedded textiles. And this work is being done at MIT in the Boston region. Uh, through that uh, institute, we were awarded a grant with Drexel, and we developed a working prototype from a small scale produced capacitive touch textile to a mass scale produced capacitive touch textile. So that really was the goal of the product is to help escalate scalability and understand what transitions and dynamics have to occur to enable that. And in doing that, what we're really paying attention to, not only through the Institute, but through all uh, universities and research groups is really minding uh, the gap between all of these activities that are going on in the textile industry and then their re manufacturing readiness level. So uh, while you have these colored cones in these pillars of textile developments, um, you also have these white gaps that form in the inverse. And so it's these peaks, if you will, that we really try to identify, you know, where we can fit and where our technology and manufacturing can enable some of these products to succeed. And in doing so, we have developed a few of fabrics. On, uh, on the left is an electrostatic discharge knit. These are very common and popular. This is a knit fabric we've made 30 years ago. Um, and and surprisingly, it can be called an e-textile. Uh, that particular type of technology has gone to Taiwan and is, is very prominent in Asia uh, from a cost perspective. Uh, but here we go into uh, the advanced functional fabrics yarn. This is the fabric that you saw knitting. And, and so you can see the LEDs that are illuminated when they're connected to power. And then this fabric can serve other functions as well. And then finally on the right is the example of the mass production full scale capacitive touch knit fabric. And so each of these little raised bars uh, act as a remote control button. And so in the capacitive touch world, you know, we're so used to our telephone screen having that functionality. Um, but then as I mentioned earlier that Google and Levi Jacket Project Jacquard uses weaving. And you can see how the multiple connectors um, coming out of both directions of that fabric are confusing and they don't seem like they're very robust, although I do believe that there has been testing, you know, and that this is a highly performing product. But it just seems 
not quite right. And then if you look where the arm is present, all of those little strands have to connect into that bus bar. Um, so it's quite tedious work, I would imagine. And we're, we're looking for something more simplified and again, commercializable. And so Drexel developed a way to have a continuous conductive pathway in weft knitting. And our goal was to do that in warp knitting so that you just have two connection points, as you see on the right where those snaps are located. And then you can have a touch location for each of those colored dots. And then you can see the output uh, rise time associated uh, with those colored dots. Uh, and so this video just shows you the sensory detection of the warp knitted version. And therefore, when you, you, know, you press on the bars, you get a response. Uh, other things you can do with the response, um, you can program it to play music. You can uh, localize the yarn system to emulate a keyboard. Um, you can put it into a uh, textile covered security robot and maybe not have to have that hard shiny panel there that is a challenge to integrate and trim around. So this is a way to maybe again integrate um, functionality into the textile that you normally might have to use harder components um, to, uh, to trim around. Um, and so one of the things I talked about at the beginning of this presentation uh, that you might want to consider is test standards and washability um, as part of your e-textile plan. Uh, and I also mentioned that there were a lack of standards, but certainly not for a lack of trying. For the past two years, IPC has established a e-textiles committee. I serve as the chairperson of that committee. And we have had a very successful two years in establishing a membership and creating a section within the IPC community for e-textiles uh, documents, standards, guidelines, white papers. Um, and we have a full suite of subcommittee structure uh, from D71 through D79 um, and a new European committee that's forming. Um, and so within each of these committees, uh, the ones that you see in black are in full swing. Um, and the D72 committee uh, has released their first standard for uh, draft comments, and we've received comments back. Uh, and so everyone is moving forward um, quite, quite well. We have a great cadence. Uh, we try to meet as often as possible um, to work on these standard topic areas of conductive functional fibers and yarns, uh, e-textiles, non-conductive coatings and chemical treatments, joining and interconnection techniques, tests and measurement, quality reliability and inspection, and device and systems. Um, and so here are the folks that are heading up our subcommittees um, for requirements for electronic textiles, conductive fibers, and conductive yarns. Uh, it's myself and Diana Wyman from AATCC. And we have Connie Huffa from Fab Designs and Mary Alice Gill at Jable who's participating on our guideline on connectors for e-textiles. And then in Europe, we have Vladan Kankar at Saint Gemtex Lab, working um, on forming new committees around sports and medical applications. So as I mentioned, our 8921 is uh, first draft comments are in, and we've identified material characteristics uh, key electrical and electronic performance characteristics and test methods. Um, there's a survey on test methods and test method frequency. And, and so we're really trying to bubble this specification up for release by the end of this year. Uh, the connector standard has a very long list of goals um, to help users and manufacturers work together and make the best decision for selecting the connector types. Connectors are uh, kind of a, a necessary commodity, if you will, that's definitely not a commodity. I think every connector system is unique at this point. 
And so at some point, maybe establishing some, some kind of common ground um, and enable us to, you know, reduce time to market and accelerate innovation. And then this European extension was just formed this year. Um, and they're off to a fantastic start um, working on application specific standards. Um, and so I invite anyone on the call and everyone on the call and people that you know um, everywhere to participate. Uh, you can comment on the standard that we'd like to release this year. You can volunteer to join the effort, propose topics, um, uh, propose and develop methods for e-textiles, submit white papers in areas where you have expertise, and then recommend topics of importance uh, to Europe or anywhere um, so that we can put them into our webinars like this or conferences. And then um, we, we have white papers, we have face-to-face -face meetings and events um, all the time that we're, we're forming in e-textiles. And here is the team of members uh, a sample listing actually of the members of 141 organizations that are participating in the e-textiles group. Uh, there are other industry groups that are also working on e-textiles. So I think it's important to know um, while we're trying to work in an environment to engage, others are and we're working with those others so that we're not a duplicating efforts or be confusing um, a very new hybrid community. Uh, where can you go for some functional fabric resources and, um, and communication dialogue and networking? Um, these places all have events this year um, and you can learn regular um, updates about the textile industry through ETC. Um, certainly ID Tech X has a lot of uh, programs around the wearables and e-textile space. The wear conference is being held in the Seattle area uh, this year in June. Uh, AFOA, of course, you can visit their website and look at membership and how you can participate in that movement. And then certainly traditional uh, standard and, and very much anticipated events like Tech Textile and ITMA are major uh, textile events that happen on a biannual and every four year uh, scenario for the textile industry. So this year, 2019 is a big year for textile trade events. And so as we move forward together, textiles and electronics, I like to say that we can become partners in ubiquity. The textiles have been around for as long as the ages and the electronics seem to have been here for just maybe 30 years or less. And maybe, maybe a little more, maybe 40 years or less. And um, they have become such an integral part of our life at, that we actually think about it more, I think, than we think about fabric that literally is all part of our life from the towels that we use after the shower to the robe and the clothes we wear throughout the day and the home textiles that surround us. So um, initially when you're new to uh, a marketplace, you could be expensive or inclusive to a certain area because you have high functionality. But then as you become mass producible, become more affordable, it becomes intimate to your life, trendy, and it spreads through multi-industry applications. So uh, we're not quite at the multi-industry spread yet, um, but we certainly are um, in an exclusive high functionality time frame um, and looking to help make things more affordable as we integrate with textiles. Uh, and so applications for every industry is what we're about and electronically integrating them is just one. And we are a company and uh, uh, have a philosophy that problem shared is problem solved. So share your problems with us and we look forward to helping you. I wanna thank you for your time and thank you, Andrea and IPC. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, we'll now open the floor for any live question and answers. So I'll just wait a few minutes to see if um, any start coming through. And if you do think of questions after the webinar is over, you can certainly email um, ipcwebinars at ipc.org.
So it doesn't look like any questions are coming through. So again, if you do have any questions, um, you can email us afterwards. Um, I guess at this point, thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.